So, so honored to, to be uh, leading this discussion today. We have an amazing group of panelists. Um, and each had wildly different backgrounds and, and played a wildly different role in, in the Hurricane Harvey recovery efforts. Um, I'll do some brief introductions. Renee Solis is the Chief Program Officer at Baker Ripley. Baker Ripley's response to Hurricane Harvey was immediate and big. Um, you know, very, very early on, even before funding sources were secured, they, they started uh, putting in place a 100-person disaster case manager team. They oversaw um, a bunch of neighborhood recovery centers and, of course, um, the NRG stadium in the immediate aftermath. Um, they also um, conducted home repairs on over 900 homes in the Houston area community. Kathy Payton, um, right here to my right, is the CEO and president of Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation. Fifth Ward's uh, mission is to work with the Fifth Ward community to create a community of choice, a better place to live, work, and play. Um, and Fifth Ward's done incredible work after Harvey in financial assistance, housing counseling, and been an amazing home repair partner for us. Um, Chris Hinsman, right in the middle, is the program officer at the Rebuild Texas Fund. So, so Chris is, is only panelist, is not one of our grantees, um, but he was another funder um, and uh, so and partnered closely with the Greater Houston Community Foundation and their Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund efforts. Um, the Rebuild Texas Fund is a collaboration between the Dell Foundation and One Star Foundation, and they too raised and deployed over $100 million after the storm. Um, in, in, the, in the broader affected area. So, so they certainly had grantees in, in, in Harris County, including my organization, Harvey Home Connect, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, but they also served in many other counties, um, rural and urban, across the affected region. So I, what, what I'm really excited about today is we have a funder, a, a representative of the largest social services provider in, in, in our city and and a representative of a local organization um, neighborhood-based organization in an area whose broader region was heavily affected um so i'd like kathy to start with you and take us back to two years ago and and talk a little bit through the response efforts both of your organization and the broader community and sure. how it's evolved over time sure thank you and good morning uh, so one of the exciting things about being a Facebook user is that they give you these memories. Uh, and ironically, this morning, my memory was a picture of me in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, in the office of the HUD secretary, uh, and followed by another meeting with the FEMA director. And ironically, I was there to advocate and appeal for the need for us to make sure that resources would be made available for families fairly quickly. I can tell you by the time I landed, GHCF had probably already written a check to us to begin the work that we have. And two years later, unfortunately, we still are waiting on federal dollars. So when Renee gave the overview of the housing impact, I was sitting back there and I'm like, can we just get up and shout and say yay, amen, or, or do something? Because that is significant, because our organization alone, not including Muck and Gut, have created opportunities for 138 families in terms of stability and full repair. The collaborative that we are part of have done in excess of 500. So these numbers speak volumes. So I want to applaud you for coming to our rescue and responding to the need. And similar to behavioral health, all I can say is for areas like Fifth Ward, it took a storm. We exist as a result of an economic disaster and a transportation disaster. And those transportation disasters were I-10 and 59. The economic disaster was the flight and flight to suburban Houston. And so when this opportunity came along, Many of us recognize the need for us to have community-based disaster recovery because so oftentimes our communities are overlooked and they're vulnerable in nature just by the aging housing stock, their inability to be responsive to the requirements of resources, uh, and the panic and the sheer uh, fear of what's about to happen in their lives. And so this opportunity made it possible for Fifth Ward to make sure 
that the numerous residents in this community were not being overlooked. And it means, it meant for us that we were able to hit the ground running, have a significant impact, and try to preserve a quality of life where people felt like that they had hope. And at that time, that's all that mattered for the people in the Fifth Ward, is that they wanted to know that there was hope. And the reason I say that they were only looking for hope is because cleanup even in Fifth Ward looked a lot different than it did in many places of Houston, uh, in Kingwood, in River Oaks, in your more affluent neighborhoods. People were sitting their piles out on the street for the trash pickup. Well, in Fifth Ward, people were sitting their piles out in the sun for it to be dried and put it back in the house because they didn't know where the next mattress was going to come from. They didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. They didn't know if they were going to be able to recover school supplies and school uniforms for the kids. They didn't know how their cars were going to be repaired so that they can get to work. And so this fund and this opportunity allowed many of the smaller organizations and grassroots organizations to reach out and touch people that we knew to reach out and help them and meet them at the point where they were. And I can tell you it was a little bit different for us as a smaller organization because we typically get resources and they're often so few that we get them and we want to hold on to them or figure out how we spread them as far and as wide as we possibly can. This opportunity gave us a, a numerous amount of flexibility to actually meet people where they are. And so that meant for us is that we had to buy medications. We had to provide uh, clean out services. We had to provide storage facilities for people to store the things that they wanted to hold on to. And as a part of the collaborative, one of the decisions that we collectively made, because many of us had already served on the long-term recovery committee or were here when Allison hit, several years ago and we couldn't believe that we were back in the same place and actually for to a certain degree took a few steps backwards and so one of the things this fund also allowed us to do was to help build resiliency for families and that one tool was the opportunity for us to purchase flood insurance for families which was making the difference between whether some families could eat pay their car note pay their house note or anything else but to give them flood insurance. So last week when Imelda hit, guess what the families in Fifth Ward were doing? They weren't necessarily sitting back with their legs crossed, but there was less anxiety and less worry because when we put this program in place, we can report as a collaborative that 75% of the families that we serve now have flood insurance. That makes a difference, guys. And so when we talk about meeting people where they are, we spent a lot of time and we learned a lot of lessons and the team from GHCF helped us with that because of your patience and understanding and investing in our infrastructure and investing in our systems. And so everybody was trying to hurry this process along in terms of recovery. And one of the things that we consistently did was to slow down to make sure that we had systems in place to make sure that we were not going to have to duplicate our efforts and redo the work and waste money in investments uh, to ensure that families had full recovery. So one of the things that we were able to do is form a collaborative with four organizations, build on our existing competencies, and put together a strategy by which we were able to clean out families' homes, stabilize them, treat the mold with the proper products, utilize our volunteers, work along with VISTA and AmeriCorps volunteers to bring staffing in, invest in our infrastructure, purchase software and Xactimate and computers so that we can work in the field and people will not have to come to our office. And then we move to what we call housing case management. And unlike many of my partners, we don't do comprehensive case management. We're only focused on housing com case management. These partners were able to take these families from where they are, put together a temporary housing plan, identify a need, find out when we could get the repairs done, make the repairs, bring them back to their homes, outfit them with furniture, and then provide ongoing case management and refer them to the next level of service. So this is what this opportunity has meant for this community and for the Fifth Ward. And while we may have had some people who've had repeat devastation as a result of Imelda, 
we were better equipped to be able to handle and respond to the need as a result of your generosity. And so hats off, Elena, for coming to the rescue and calling us very early on in Imelda so that we can demonstrate the readiness and our ability to continue to be able to respond to the needs of the families that we serve. So thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind passing to Renee. Um, Renee, I want to ask you the same question, and really this is, you know, how, how have you seen the recovery landscape evolve over the last two years? Have you seen the needs change, and how have you seen your organization's role change? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and like Kathy, I would add, I also had a memory moment the other day. It didn't come through social media, but I was at NRG Center for the State of the Region Address by Speaker Bonham. And I just walked the halls and I just remembered everything that we saw, that we experienced, and the conversations that we had with those folks. Uh, so it was kind of a, another moment where you just kind of remember, it's like, you know, there was a lot of suffering at that time. Uh, but to your question, Elena, yes, so th we do see that there's different phases in the recovery. I mean, when we started at the NRG shelter after Hurricane Harvey hit, we could see how people were in despair and how temporary housing was a big need how stabilization and basic needs was was significant for for folks to, to get back on their feet uh, and then it kind of moves towards uh, how do you get and stabilize your housing uh, how do you go ahead and stabilize uh, your jobs and your other things that may have been impacted as a, as a result of the, of the hurricane um, so there is different phases um, the long-term recovery phase is one of the most difficult phases, um, especially when your home was damaged um, because you just feel that you can't get to the place that you were before the hurricane. So uh, as we're working with uh, the long-term recovery phase, it's important to recognize uh, that individuals uh, have different priorities in terms of the recovery. Uh, with housing being the first one, um, furniture being sort of followed by that, uh, and then other basic needs that you have. Um, uh, whether it be job, your job status, the employment you may have been affected, or whether it had been your savings that were impacted, uh, or it could have been something else along the lines of mental health or behavioral health. So uh, there is different phases of it. Um, when we opened up our neighborhood restoration centers, I'll give you that as an example. At first, a lot of the folks that were coming in were coming in for basic needs. They were coming in for cleaning supplies, so that they could get their house or their homes muck and gutted. Uh, they were coming in for food because they had you know, lost their, their refrigerators and, and all of the food losses that they had experienced. So uh, initially there was a lot of that going on. Then as uh, you know, time passed, uh, the folks that were coming to our neighborhood restoration centers wanted information. They wanted connection to resources. They needed answers on how to get out of this situation and how to move forward with the recovery process. Um, at some point then, um, you know, case management kicks in and the case managers work with the, with the families or the individuals to develop a recovery plan, to really boil down and list in priority what are the things that needs to happen with an individual or household so that they can fully recover from uh, the, the hurricane or from the disaster. So yeah, there's many different phases. Um, and for that reason, Baker Ripley, uh, we decided to do different things throughout the recovery phase. We started, of course, with NRG, then we did our neighborhood restoration centers, case management, and then the home repair process. Uh, because again, uh, that's one of the, the greatest needs is when we have floods and uh, homes are no longer habitable, people just need to get back into their homes. Awesome. Chris, I'd like to ask you to speak a little bit about the overall funding landscape, both philanthropic and, if you don't mind touching on government, I know that in the last panel as well as Renee um, touched on the, the, the difference between the philanthropic and government funding on timing, right, as well as magnitude. So if you could talk about the overall philanthropic landscape, Rebuild Texas' specific approach and how that fit into the um, government funding as well. Sure, I think what we saw early on uh, from our perspective was that there were a number of funds that were very successful, which is not normally the case after a disaster. Um, in our area, what that meant was we saw that Greater Houston Community Foundation um, and others had secured a lot of funding for the Greater Houston area. Uh, because we had responsibility for the 41 impacted counties, we said, 
GHCF, its partners, other Houston-based organizations have Houston in hand for the moment. Let's let them run with it. Let's let see how that money begins to absorb early on. And then we can enter in maybe three to six months later and start to fill in gaps or build out programs that maybe uh, we don't see in existence yet. Uh, and so that was a little bit of our approach. We tried to collaborate as much as possible. We appreciate the information sharing among all of the funders. It was incredible to be able to learn from each other, to be able to call up other foundations, partners, and say, hey, do you have a, a great nonprofit in this space or in this geography? Um, that type of information sharing, I think, really shortcutted a lot of the learning process that most uh, of us go through to try and develop these programs. Um, on the government side, what I would say is we all knew that it takes a long time uh, to get government assistance. Uh, that's a part of pretty much every conversation you have with somebody who's been through this before. Uh, in Harvey, I think it was compounded by the fact that with case management especially, uh, there were new contracts and procedures being put in place. And so we didn't really see the first federally funded case managers until May uh, after the storm. If not, I think that's when they were funded. So they may not have even been that active on the ground until later that summer. So we really only had them for about a year. And now they're already starting to draw down. Uh, so I think that's one important lesson learned is just the value of case managers on the ground early and the value that that can provide to people trying to recover to get that information early, to figure out what their needs are, uh, et cetera. Um, the other thing is the housing recovery dollars take a long time to arrive. You don't know what the restrictions are on those dollars or the application process. You don't even know in some cases who's going to get them. Um, and so I think that can cause, that it raises expectations for the region. Because a lot of folks assume that FEMA is going to make them whole. And that's just not the purpose of FEMA programs. It's supposed to give people a leg up and help stabilize individuals and their families and their households, but it's not there to make them whole again. And, I, and so there's a huge uh, difference in, in expectations there that we need to manage. Um, when the, the full housing program comes into play, because you have the initial individual assistance, which was the grants of up to $33,333 uh, for households, you also have the broader uh, housing assistance program, which is what we're seeing administered through GLO, the city and the county. Those programs uh, only got started this year, uh, probably mid-year, taking applications. GLO is already out of money with its program. Uh, so they've started forming a wait list. Now, hopefully. And, and just for, to, for clarification, that's the general land office and the general land Thank office you. of Texas is administering the, the, the HUD funding outside of the city of Houston and Harris County. And Harris County. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there you've got folks who have been waiting for a year and a half to apply for these programs. They now have their first opportunity to apply and they're already on the wait list. So I think we just need to recognize that the government is going to help. How do we best take advantage of those programs? How do we start formulating those applications and those lists and preparing people so that they are able to take advantage of those programs when they arrive? And then how do we build ahead? So specifically for our fund, um, I just mentioned a couple of things that we did that I think made us effective. One was we showed up on the ground. So you'll see I'm wearing my, my fishing shirt today. Uh, when I go out in the communities, want to meet with people in their homes, uh, want to make sure that we're accessible to them. When I showed up with my, uh, with my suit on, uh, <laughs> they really didn't know what to make of me. They were very nervous and suspicious. Uh, so uh, I found that all the county judges uh, and county commissioners had the fishing shirts on. Uh, I got one. And it's, it's funny how those small barriers can crop up between people. Um, but we do try to show up in communities. And what we're trying to do is understand people and their problems. Who are the organizations active on the ground? Who's leading those organizations? Who are the county officials that are the most relevant? Who are the religious leaders that are really involved in recovery? Who are the other community leaders? Uh, once we start with make you want, not what are the solutions, but please, let's start with the problems. What are the challenges that you're facing? And then let's develop those solutions together. 
So in a lot of cases, a community will assume, I mean, the first time I went to Port Arthur, they asked me for a million dollars worth of drywall. Uh, sheetrock is only going to get folks so far. Uh, you know, even if you just take it at face value, well, what about the mold remediation? You can't just put sheetrock up without mold remediation chemicals. What about the screws? What about the mud? There's lots of other factors, but people can sometimes get fixated on a solution. And so one of the things we really tried to do is work with them in partnership to develop a real strategy around how we were going to overcome some of the challenges that they were facing. Um, the other thing that I would mention is we, we really have tried to push ahead of the curve. Um, I assume we're gonna be faced with these challenges again. Uh, and that's not always the case depending on who you talk to. So for some of the homes that we're repairing, if we know within one to five years that home is going to flood again, and we're gonna be back spending 15 to $40,000 to put it back together, is that the most prudent investment? And there are a number of ways that we can solve for that, and I'm happy to talk about them more later, but we really wanted to start looking past just the one storm, just recovering from this to say, what do we need to do to get ahead of the curve for the future? Great, I think that's a great segue into, I, I wanted to talk about, and, and I actually have this, <laughs> um, that you know, I often tell people who are not in the weeds of disaster recovery space that Harvey exposed a lot of our, the cracks in our physical infrastructure, but it also exposed a lot of the cracks in our social services infrastructure. I know Kathy spoke to that earlier when she talked about it, it took a storm for Fifth Ward to really get the res some of the resources they need. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about in, specifically in the affordable housing and sustainable own, home ownership space, what are those you know, cracks that Harvey really revealed? Um, and, and, and how would you like to see us as a community to be addressing those cracks in a, in a way that goes beyond just disaster recovery? So for the Fifth Ward community, I think one of the things that we recognize is that there was already a housing shortage in terms of affordable housing. Uh, in the city of Houston, I've heard some numbers thrown around that prior to the storm, there were about 18,000 units short. And today, post Harvey and now post Imelda, we're about 300,000 units short, combined single family and multifamily. And prior to Harvey, I would say that affordable housing was this ugly word that, uh, that suffered from nimbyism. And now there's a greater appreciation for the need for affordable housing. What we find in underserved and vulnerable communities like the Fifth Ward, however, there were a number of uh, what I'm going to call deferred maintenance issues that further enhanced our cost, our ability to rehab. Uh, we didn't want to put good money on top of bad money. And so while the damages or the ensuing damages from the disaster may have been rising water, uh, but we couldn't go in and stabilize the foundation without fixing the roof or without re-insulating the house or weatherizing the house or repairing windows or bringing it to code when we identified faulty electrical or faulty plumbing problems. So what we found is, is that given the aging housing stock, uh, one of the things that we needed to make sure that we do is have a complete assessment on where the community is, where the housing stock is, and develop a plan, as Chris talked about, that would survive the next storm. And what that meant was is that it left, unfortunately, a lot of families in influx because we did not even know if families were actually going to be bought out uh, as a result of multiple <coughs> and repeat floodings or if we were able to go in and actually rebuild. And particularly, you have areas in Fifth Ward where the average value of the house is $50,000 and repairs or in excess of 30,000 and you end up spending more than 50% of the value, is that a prudent investment? So in areas like that, we were faced with a number of challenges in terms of what the best plan of action would be for that family. We were also plagued, I'm oh. sorry. Oh, I just wanted to, to hop in and just say that, I, you know, I really feel that this is something we need to figure out before the next storm because when we were in the midst of crisis we were trying to put together these plans for these families but the thing is right now we know you know which families are living in homes worth less than fifty thousand dollars in floodplains 
You know, imagine if we if if we actually you know had a targeted strategy around those families before the next big one. Yeah. And last of all, I'll say that we were struck with the issues of families who reside in Occupy homes and may not necessarily be the owner of record or have anything that would produce a trail that we could get to some ownership status. And then working with absentee landlords who did not have an appreciation for the urgency to help families recover. And so being able to uh, identify and use legal services was critically important to help families who are heirs to properties, who have been longtime occupants of properties, to have some possession in terms of ownership and avoid resale and avoid us investing in properties and they turn around and sell them on the market. And so there were a lot of questions that we had to have answered and a lot of policies that we had to put in place to ensure that these homes that we invested in will remain affordable and remain livable for the long term. And lastly, I'll say the, the last thing that we certainly have to be cognizant of is that when we look at families who have housing vulnerabilities, oftentimes there are other vulnerabilities. And so when we had to look at it, we had to create opportunities where even if we were able to repair the home, what was it we, going, we were going to do to ensure the family could afford that home long term? Because people were not counting loss of jobs, loss of income, changes in income, and things like that. And, and many people in the Fifth Ward were being victimized because now we had speculators wanting to come in and buy them out. And so how do we avoid people walking away from homes, preserving their mortgages, living in shelters, or living in temporary housing, and trying to afford a mortgage? And so these individual plans yielded that we were on average having to make investment in families' lives beyond the repair and the stability of the home, but just to stabilize their personal life and a quality of life where they could afford to live without the stresses of the financial burdens. Thank you, Kathy. I'm gonna ask um, both Chris and Renee to just, and, and then I wanna open it up to, to, to two questions to the audience to just say, what do you think right now in, in, a, in a sentence or less is the biggest recovery need related to housing in, in a the sentence Houston or area? Less. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say a word, but I thought that was too, that wasn't generous enough. <laughs> biggest need. Biggest need, there, there is no one need. If I have to pick what I'm gonna do first, it's going to be to get the strategy right for neighborhoods uh, that we continue to invest in or continue to repair homes in. I don't believe it's just to put someone back in harm's way, to, to perpetuate their vulnerability. There are complicated issues about community and history and culture as well. So just relocating, just moving people, just breaking up communities is not a solution as well. But we really need to come up and work with communities to figure out how are we going to reduce the vulnerability as opposed to continuing to just patch people up and, and send them forward just to face another storm. Thank you. That was a great that answer. So it's okay yeah. that, you know, it's more <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Renee, what do you? Well, I just want to be clear that 25 months after Harvey, there's still many folks whose homes are not repaired. Uh, even with the quick response of the Greater uh, Houston Community Foundation and others, uh, and the work that nonprofits have been able to do, uh, there's still thousands of individuals whose homes are inhabitable or incomplete. And uh, we did great work as, as both the philanthropic community in Houston as well as the nonprofit community in Houston to get us back on our feet but they're still, we're still crutching along. Uh, and uh, I wanna recognize that that is still the reality for many, many of the, of the households, even some of the ones that, uh, some of the homes that we worked on, because we know we, we weren't able to complete the mission for full recovery because of lack of resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, so before I open it up to, to two audience questions, I just wanna say too that I really appreciate all of your partnership and the work that we've done with Harvey Home Connect, which was Originally funded by the by HHRF, um, and and has has essentially is a common application and coordination system on for all of the Houston and Harris County home repair efforts. Through that work, collectively, we've rebuilt at this point over 700 homes and have another 
um, 400 or so in queue, and, and both Baker Ripley and Fifth Ward were active participants there. And then Rebuild Texas has funded us along with a couple other funders to um, be a permanent disaster response system for the region. So that is also just, it's this amazing infrastructure we built. Okay, question for the, our awesome panelists. Mm -hmm. well, I just want to say thank you to all of you for your hard work and efforts on the ground. And my question is for Kathy. You mentioned that you were able to provide 75% of residents with flood insurance. That 25% remaining, is it because of lack of funding that you couldn't provide flood insurance? We brought that part of the program on a little bit later, and the families that we were able to assist were already identified as living in or residing in a flood zone area, so we were able to provide the insurance. So some of the families already had their own, or they didn't live in a flood zone area uh, and declined the uh, support. I will say though that that funding was for what, one or two years? Two years. Two years. After that point, what happens with those families? So, so, you know, that's as, as far as, I know there are a lot of funders in the room, as far as an ongoing need, you know, that's important. All right, one more question. Guy. Uh, I just was curious from your perspective, if you could design a strategy to deal with this tension capital that you mentioned between, and several of you mentioned about getting people out of harm's way, uh, getting vulnerable housing out of the floodplain, and this incredible shortage of affordable housing that we have, where as we do that, we're reducing potentially the number of available units. But is there a strategy that you all have in mind about how to tackle that conundrum? <laughs> Well, we're going to have a fantastic last speaker who can speak about the city's resiliency plan. Um, I also think the city needs a comprehensive housing plan. That's something that's been talked about for a long time still needs to happen uh, and then we also just need to look at uh, the challenges on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis so making sure that we're involving communities in that discussion process I think the resiliency plans that we're looking at moving forward have been a very inclusive process and have been tried to bring a lot of folks to the table we need to get those down to a very granular level uh, I also think that we need to just invest more broadly in the systems and that the city has to uh, deal with its challenges on blue sky days and during disasters. Case management uh, and the data collection around that is really important. There's been a number of proposals that haven't quite gotten off the ground to really understand from a client perspective what are the challenges and how do we get ahead of some of those problems. So if deferred maintenance caused a tremendous amount of damage in our city, it's a lot cheaper to handle the deferred maintenance than it is the subsequent damage. So we need to incorporate some of those plans as well. Uh, but it, I think it's really gonna be neighborhood dependent. And I think we also need to remember, it's not just going, going to be flooding. Uh, extreme heat is going to be an issue for our city moving forward. Uh, there are potential uh, other di man-made disasters that could impact our city. So as we're thinking about resiliency to flood, we should also be incorporating some of these other threats into the planning. Uh, it's gonna be a long process. It's not gonna be for any one storm, but I think the more that we have that long vision, the better we're able to then align these individual programs.